Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. I'm your host, Deacon John, joined by my other host, Jason Metal. Hello, Jason. Hello there. So I always say exciting show and an exciting guest, but today, uh, Talk Gnosis has been running for more than 10 years, I believe. Uh, we might be up what? to, to ele- yeah, it might be 11 or 12. And today we have a guest that we've been trying to get on since day one. It's uh, <laughs> uh, a man who's a good friend and a good teacher to both of us, who also takes our mocking abuse with uh, in stride. It's his evidence, Sean McCann, the patriarch of the Joe and I Church. Hello, your evidence. Howdy. So believe it or not, today we're going to be talking about the Joe and I Church, though uh, Jason does have some questions about the present. We're mostly going to be uh, delving into the past, not even the ancient past, actually. We're going to have to have you back to talk about the ancient Joe and I Church, and then the medieval Joe and I Church, and now the more modern Joe and I Church. But we're going to be talking about Fabre Palaprat and his uh, revival of the Joe and I Church and the Templar tradition. But before we do, before we do, We've got a quick commercial. Uh, We're the world's uh, first um, guest-supported podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Listen, these guys. This is where they usually beg for money. So you know, I'm. Let me let me tell you about things because I'm told I'm the boss and I reasonably run the 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 show, the evil umbrella corporation. You know, behind this little little outfit. They've been trying to get me on this thing for for about 10 years, but I'm notoriously (laughs) cheap. And so, you know, the the funds that come into the AJC for the various work we do, mission type stuff, education, whatnot, we don't give them a dime of it, right? Because, you know, I'm cheap. It's also these guys. You know, maybe if it was someone else, I'd I'd slide them something under the table, but I know (laughs) these guys, so we don't do that. So these guys, unfortunately, have been stuck saving up their box tops their you know cereal sides their bottle caps or whatever (laughs) all to earn the requisite amount of points to finally get me off my butt to appear on this show for the next 10 years right so or for for you know the first time in 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 10 years right so these guys this is this is this is a hand-to-mouth operation and they've been they've been very diligently you know uh, uh saving all their scraps to convince me that this is something finally worth doing so my main point here is that these guys are <laughs> these guys are working with pennies okay i mean you know uh intellectually they're billionaires financially not so much right so uh, anything you can do to support these guys cuz i certainly don't um, you know, is greatly appreciated. I mean, I, when I say I certainly don't, I mean, I do. I, we just don't give them money because it's donated for other things. So these guys, you know, they, they work and do th- this thing. So every time, you know, they put out an episode, every time, you know, they're scheduling time off work or away from the other things they're doing, they're doing it out of their own pocket. They're doing it uh, out of their own time and they're doing it out of their own you know, willpower, frankly, to, to put this all together and deliver solid content every week. And they they need your support, right? Um, these guys produce solid stuff time after time. Uh, great practitioners, great scholars, you know, and frankly, they're great hosts. They do a, they do a great job. And this is this is the reason why I'm saying this is because it's recorded and then I don't have to say it again. And you guys can just rewind and replay it when you need a little bit of a self-esteem boost or something, right? <laughs> So my point is, these guys have a have a Patreon, Patreon, however you want to call it, account. It's like a it's like a tip jar, and you know, putting in like a a, a buck an episode, it's nothing, right? I'm not going to make a joke about Starbucks or avocado toast or any of these other kind of things, even though I know that the Reverend Jonathan is a little bit of a hipster. But uh, the reality is, is every quarter you pitch in, you know, is an opportunity for them to square away some time to do some great topics, to talk to some great speakers and to share some great insights. So anything you can donate is fantastic. And it also saves me from having to do so, so that we can put the uh, the AJC focus on, uh, you know, on, on helping people out in the pews and of course out in the world. So uh, every, every penny counts, pitch in if you can. If you can't, um, you know, share the episodes talk about the episodes. Heck, if you're interested, appear on the show, right? Every every little bit uh, counts, whether, you know, in actual donations or in kind. So please, come on, help these guys out. Jonathan's been begging, you know, every, every, <laughs> every week. I've long since put my phone on mute, um, you know, <laughs> to have some charity. 
<laughs> Thank you so much, Your Eminence. That was no uh, that was beautiful, moving, and I, I agree with every word. But uh, I will definitely be uh, uh, rewinding that and uh, listening to it. So I do love uh, these guys; they're fantastic. Oh, oh, oh. we. We love you too, and uh, the, you know we we interact the three of us quite a bit. Um, so that's why it's really fun to be doing you know this show together, right? To, to bring some of the interesting conversations that we have off the record, um, and actually talk about interesting conversations that the three of us have. You know, the, J Jason is here with the uh, with the cattle prod because his eminence and I will we'll talk about minute details and lineages and uh, French guys and influences influences that they might have uh, had until the, the cows come home so um yeah, talking about that yeah that that's i was gonna say a great segue because like i think <clears throat> one of the things that i've found um so like uh, a, a lot of what sean's here to talk about is about like the um the, the history of the ajc and 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 that, what, what that community where that community came from but um i also like i thought saw this as an opportunity to talk about um, like as a as somebody who found that Gnosticism really spoke to him, but not, uh, but I wasn't coming from a particularly church based background. Um, I was compelled by the AJC's drive for scholarship and engagement, and uh, and the 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 idea of the search. It, this definitely seemed like the group that was probably the most level headed among all the Gnostics that I could find. Um, but it still did have. Uh, I did have a lot of questions of like, why? Why does the, why do things look so churchy? Why? Why do things uh, uh, work the way they do here? And uh, and I and I've over. I think what did we find out, Sean? It's been like thirteen years, fourteen years since I first yeah. emailed yeah, you maybe, and said, maybe "Hey, longer, yeah. probably, probably fifteen years actually." Yeah, I think where yeah. I, I went for coffee with with Sean and and uh, one of his associates, um, and uh, yeah, and like. The despite my lack of churchiness, uh, it the 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 flame of gnosis was was strong enough that I that I was still feeling compelled to stay. All of that said, that that's my little story about how I got here. But I've I think I've often wondered, like Sean, what was the thing that got that made made this approach speak to you, even before we get to the details of it? Well, um, I mean, I grew up I grew up in a Oh boy, I mean, I was baptized Roman Catholic, and that was probably about the entirety of, uh, you know, my duration as a Roman Catholic was however long it took for the baptism uh, to go on and the ceremony to end, uh, uh, essentially. And, you know, in my family, there were pretty much only two people that were, were you know, religious, and I was one of them. And the, the entire reason, you know, that I got exposed to religion at all was from my grandpa, who was, a, a, you know, pretty dyed in the wool, um, you know, Dutch Reformed, Christian Reformed Church, uh, which is Calvinist. And, and, you know, Calvinism is a pretty scary thing. But my, my you know, my grandpa was functionally... Uh, uh, you know, uh, a saint in my experience. And even looking back when you, when you shed, you know, when you shed the rosy hues of uh, memory or history or your own, uh, you know, personal experience, I can find, you know, little, little fault in his character. So he took that, he took that light, or rather that light of spirituality kind of shone through the prism of his character and got, you know, refracted into a, a much better and, and brighter thing than, um, you know, first pass through it. So he's the one that got me to go to church. But of course, uh, you get into your teens and, uh, you know, and I don't want to say that's really where the, you know, rebellion happened or anything typical like that. But you go through the, you know, the idea, okay, who am I? What do I believe? Why am I here? You know, those kind of things. And, you know, my mind began to stray into the, the, the you know, the heterodox and, and all things interesting, mystical, esoteric, that kind of thing. I mean, let's be honest, I grew up in a Calvinist church that's not orthodox by by any stretch. Of course, they think they are, but by Christian standards, it would be, um, you know, unrecognizable to someone 700 years ago. But uh, so, you know, I went to the, you know, I went to the, uh, you know, catechism classes and all that other kind of thing. But the you know, the further, the further I went into it, once you get beyond the whole basic, you know, Jesus, 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 and am I saved? And you actually get into the nitty gritty fine grain of what they believe in. I, I, I don't believe this. Uh, however, the, the basic overarching 
um, you know, framework, the idea of the Trinity, those, those kind of things. I mean, those things resonated with me in broad strokes, but the, the, the details were just not good. And uh, so I began to, um, you know, I began to kind of push my mind further out into uh, uh, different ideas. And, you know, and that's when I, that's when I discovered, you know, uh, mysticism, uh, you know, things like, of course, the, you know, Hermetic Kabbalah, um, the tarot, you know, those kind of things, your, your standard, you know, whatever you're going to find locally on the shelf from something like uh, Llewellyn, but thankfully, I didn't, uh, I didn't stop there. So then there becomes the inevitable point, how do you how do you reconcile these things? How do you rec how do you reconcile the kind of broad strokes of Christianity with with an esoteric, uh, you know, worldview? And if you do, is there a place where you can go um, that is comfortable with with those kind of things? Or if you haven't settled it, is there a place you can go where you can work it out in real time? Right. Where that kind of struggle, that back and forth, that you know, well, I kind of thought I liked this idea, but it turns out I don't, I'm more over here, where you can kind of work that out, you know, out loud in a in a company of, of equals and peers, um, and have that process be okay, you know, surely, surely there has to be, you know, a church where that can be done. Now, on the other hand, of course, I also went into standard, you know, teenage, early adult, you know, rebellion. I played in a, I played in a punk band. I've been playing guitar for, I don't know, 25, 26, 27 years, uh, since, since my teens. So I played in a band. It was, it was pretty bad. Um, cause of course, you know, why bother to learn the, the instrument, just pick it up and, and play. Right. And, uh, you know, and write songs while you're at it. And most of those songs are just terrible. But, uh, um, so with that came kind of the, you know, the, uh, uh, sex, drugs and rock and roll, roll so-called or whatever kind of equivalent you can experience as a, you know, guy who's 17, 18, 18, 19, um, which kind of, you know, derailed most of my priorities where spirituality was concerned, you know, and of course, you know, bothering to go to college, those kind of things. Um, and you know, that created eventually, you know, the other end of the rubber band comes snapping back. And, you know, and I found myself, uh, you know, mentally, emotionally, and physically not in a not in a very good place. And but, you know, with patience, a bit of determination, um, you know, and, and support, I eventually, you know, managed to reorient uh, myself in a, you know, in a much healthier life uh, direction. And, you know, there were moments where I, 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 where when I came out of that, I looked back on it and I said, you know, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of a terrible experience to go to. I mean, looking back, I mean, it wasn't anything super huge or monumental. Most, most human beings go through a, a version of that with, you know, different contexts, different hangups, that kind of thing. But I look back and I said, well, um, you know, I don't, I don't want people to feel, uh, you know, alone in that way or to struggle in that way. Um, and much in the way that, you know, I began to wonder, you know, is there a community that kind of can allow you to work out these theological, these spiritual, these esoteric or philosophical questions in, you know, real time? Is there also, you know, going to be a community of people or, or, or persons where you can struggle with life in real time and not be put out the door, right? And, you know, so one is very, you know, physical, you know, mental, emotional problems of the world. And the others, the higher things, so-called, the spiritual, theological, da, da, da. And it turns out the answer to the question, um, you know, dovetailed in the, in the same places, right? That, you know, if you, if you want that kind of space, um, you're going to have to start by offering it. You're going to have to start to a certain degree by creating it. Now, thankfully, in this case, I didn't have to create it, right? My my esoteric interests uh, first um, got uh, attracted online to a, you know, hermetic Ogdoatic style organization called the, the Friary, also known as the Order of the Sacred Flame. And so I said, hey, you know, I'm actually interested in formal initiation, in learning something, and in being a part of, uh, I just realized the coffee's in the way, sorry about that, um, you know, in, in actually formally undertaking, um, you know, esoteric studies. I mean, it wasn't the exact thing I was looking for, but, uh, you know, it was a place, at least on the esoteric end, 
where I could kind of work out those questions and actually embark on something solidly and just not whatever self-study I managed to do by, you know, scraping together my pennies to, you know, buy Israel Regardi's big black book stop or, you know, a doorstop, right? You know, the Golden Dawn and those kind of things from the local New Age shop. So it was in the course of that correspondence that, uh, you know, I discovered the person who would end up being uh, my predecessor in the AJC, James Foster. And, you know, and I found out he was a Gnostic priest and bishop and, you know, he, and he was running this uh, infinitesimally tiny, uh, you know, Gnostic church called the Apostolic Joanite Church. And at that point in time, um, the AJC was more or less, you know, the tiny backroom arm of the friary and not the other way around to a certain degree in the fashion that we know it now, though the friary is more active than it was then. Um, and, you know, so when I discovered this, uh, and I said, okay, wow, it, it turns out, you know, um, uh, in some unintentional way, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I wanted one thing, I found another, and of course, in the course of founding, finding another, I found the thing I was looking for, which was actually the church. And, uh, you know, uh, fresh, you know, a couple of years fresh off, you know, my, uh, uh, experiences of better living through through chemistry. I said, you know, the, the time the time to strike is 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 now. I have, you know, I have my focus. I have I have my youth. I have a I have a reason to do this to turn around and 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 help and try and uh, uh, assist people. You know, uh, I might not be the smartest, fastest, strongest, whatever, but I have experience. And if there's anything if there's anything that uh, is kind of part and parcel to being a Gnostic, well, it's the idea of experience, particularly personal experience with the divine, but also a degree of mm. self-knowledge. And, uh, you know, through stumbling and falling on my face, I learned a lot of stuff about myself and I figured that I could turn that to to use for somebody else. Maybe, maybe not in the sense of, you know, being able to guide them out of their own particular thing, but somebody who's waiting on the other end uh, for when they, they come out. And now, uh, you know, 20 years later, I mean, you know, I've been a priest with the AJC for 20 years now. And so this is kind of, you know, where I landed and, and where I ended up. But that's kind of the the personal story of kind of how I came to uh, how I came to the AJC, how I came to formalized esotericism, in fact, and uh, why I'm sitting here. The that is a uh, I, I just got to call out the the one thing about being a Gnostic is is going through experience. That's that's just a, like a great little quotable line right there, um, among many other quotable lines. And I think the the only thing uh, this is this is sort of my my semi journalistic uh, drive here going is that what I what I'd love for you to try to uh, un unpack if it's possible is that like what was it specifically about finding the AJC compared to the Friary. That, what was that aha moment? What was that feeling of like, oh yes, this is this is what I like. Well, you're not gonna, you're not going to magic the occult esotericism. You know, is such where, you know, unless you're unless you're a teacher of you know historic or cultural renown, you know, and I and I mean there there are you know occult teachers, esoteric teachers, magical teachers are a dime a dozen. Um, and, you know, nine tenths of them don't say anything new or particularly useful, right? But there are some people that are absolutely fantastic. And I can think of, you know, a, a dozen or two um, that, you know, that I, I can consider historically to be stellar above and beyond, particularly people that live in, in the modern age, right? But that's, you know, that's a couple dozen folks out of thousands and thousands of authors and teachers and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands, if not you know, a million or two, you know, practitioners, at least in, in this half of the world, right? So unless you're absolutely, you know, exceptional, um, you know, the, the Kabbalistic tree of life, the Neoplatonic chain of being, the, you know, the cosmology, the Elu Cohen's, any of these type of things, you know, when applied to the world, more, you know, more often than not, isn't necessarily going to change another life except for your own, yeah. mm. right? Um, I, you know, these are powerful tools. There's a reason why we use them, why we study them, why we're fascinated by them, and we and we do them in community. But it's the community experience that makes the difference. You know, uh, you're, you're not necessarily going to somebody on the street, you know, and saying, "I'm a magician. How can I help you?" 
right? They'd be like, <laughs> what the hell are you talking about? So, you know, the thing, the thing about the church was a way to, to, you know, embrace some of the deeper, more personal, more transformative concepts that you find in esotericism, but actually make it understandable, applicable in, you know, in the real world where most people couldn't give a crap about Gershom Sholem, Pico, Pico de Mirandola or Alistair Crowley, right? Because they don't mm. know who you're talking about. So they're, you know, they're, so all these great high fluting concepts and all this stuff is, is fantastic. You know, as you might say, you know, what is this, what does this do for me when I'm getting cut off in traffic? How do I take this meditation, you know, off the, the, the map, you know, magic is a way to look and think of, think about ourselves, but when it comes to actually serving and doing out in the world, you know, you're not, you're not going out there with your, your wand and your cup and your sword or whatever, and say, you know, I'm, I'm ready to transform society. I'm sorry. It's just not happening. Right. You know, the, the idea of magic is, is to transform yourself. So, you know, the church is a ground, a, a platform, a foundation, um, you know, of service. And I don't mean like clergy service to, the lady, I mean, of service of one human being to the other, right? You know, it's, it's the, you know, it's the, it's the field in, in, in where you work with the kind of context, you know, and, and foundation, you know, the, so esotericism, you know, is something I can do for myself. The church is something I can do for somebody else. Okay. Right. I've got to say, this is like, I, you may have just articulated the other reason why I've stuck around all this, all these years. Um, uh, so again, to the to to listeners at home, I've been asking Sean the question of like, okay, but but how does this apply when I'm getting cut off in traffic? Pretty much since I started showing up, um, and uh, and he's always had really great answers for that. But I think what I'm so happy is that the way you've articulated that and the, the reason this community I think really speaks to me. This is uh, also this is not an advertisement for the AJC. This is honestly yeah. just me <laughs> responding yeah. immediately to what I'm hearing from Sean. Is uh, is that this is a this is a, a focus on community and a focus on helping others in a way that a lot of other gnostic groups tend not to be there there uh there tends to be more of a focus on how do i get out of this world how do i escape uh it, it's it's exterior focused and it's not going like how do i help somebody who's standing in front of me you know and how yeah. do i talk to them in a way that doesn't require them to know who either philip k dick is or the entire kabbalah you know um, Here, so, I mean, here's the thing, you know, Gnosis, you know, I mean, we can get into classical definitions, you know, medieval definitions, modern definitions where Gnosis and Gnosticism is concerned, but everything is based on experience. Everything is based on a process of what we would call acquaintanceship, right? You know, it's, it's relational. It's the, it's the process of knowledge. It's the difference between saying, I know mathematics and physics and I know Jason Memel, right? One is experience and relational. The other is, 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 is information. And so Gnosis is, is, a pro, is relational. It's a process of, of relationship, particularly between us and the divine. So anything that is relational in nature, right? Because, because the, the, the gulf, the distance or the lack thereof between uh, us and the divine is experienced relation, relationally anything else that is relational in nature has an opportunity to speak to that or, or connect to that. So I am more likely to see the face of the divine in, in my fellow human being than I am to necessarily see it um, out in the world or, or in the mirror. That's the way, that's the way it is. Right. I mean, you know, um, you know, I've been married, I've been married 10 years and, you know, I'm pretty sure my wife hasn't noticed that every year I get it just a little bit fatter. Right. But the people, you know, but the people I encounter in, in the world, you know, with a, you know, particular degree of, you know, distance or discipline, you know, are going to to pick up those things. There, there are certain things where with familiarity, we don't necessarily we don't necessarily notice them. So the, the so the 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 practice of being out in community of, of serving your fellow human beings, you know, of of of, you know, serving the earth rather than the world or the systems, uh, so-called you know, is an idea, is a, is a way to uh, come into contact kind of thing with, per, with perspectives you lack. And then, of course, um, you know, angles on the divine. There was an old stoner friend of mine from 20 some years ago. We're still friends, but life just, 
you know, keeps him in school and keeps me working and doing those kind of things. And one, one time off the cuff, he said to me, um, you know, learn from the mistakes of others because you're probably not going to live long enough to learn from your own. The thing is, is you can flip those over, right? There are aspects of ourselves, you know, uh, related to the positive, related to growth, related to insight that we don't necessarily, uh, um, understand or notice about ourselves or even have the ability to be aware of to to cultivate until we encounter them through the relation with with other human beings so um, community gives you an opportunity to to work out the negatives and uh, enhance the positives precisely because of that relational quality I mean everything is essentially you know uh, a mirror form or a micro microcosmic kind of form of that experiential uh, uh, relation with the, with the divine, we have an opportunity to to uh, encounter it in in every every person and thing we meet. Yeah, um, I've got like other questions around like the community formation and just like why so churchy, um, but I'm going to save those. <laughs> we're here to talk, I feel talk like... about a French guy with sideburns and pants. Exactly. Um, cause yeah. I think we're probably uh, a spoiler warning going to be, this might be a two part episode. So some of those may be more churchy questions. I'll save for the top of the second half. Um, Fair enough. Because yeah. I know that Jonathan John John's probably been like, uh, but I've got details I need to ask about. <laughs> <laughs> no, th this is good, and then uh, it, it's good to both start and end with, with some of these topics because it it does tie into why this stuff matters, right? Like there is a reason yeah. why lineage, history, people from the past, movements from the past, they may not be the most important aspect, but when you're looking at the big picture, it does actually all tie together. Uh, but before we get there, you know, I, I'd quickly like to say, you know, building on what his eminence was saying is, you know, Gnosticism is about knowing oneself. And, and I think we often think that that means you go into, you know, a dimly lit, lit or dark room and you sit down and you go in deep, right, to to figure out everything about yourself. And and I think there's there's truth to that. But we also know ourselves through the other. Uh, it, it might be the only way to know ourselves, right? Because the other sees things about ourselves that we can't see and aspects about ourselves that we hide from ourselves, uh, aspects about ourselves that we lie to ourselves about. And I'm trying to, now I'm trying to not to make it sound selfish, but to be a Gnostic is to know oneself and we can only fully know oneself through the help of the other. So I, I think that's that's an important aspect of, of the work and uh, that, that his eminence is, is touching upon uh, as well. Um, but uh, finally, before we get into the good questions, the reason why I've stuck around and have always liked the AJC is that that emphasis on service, on helping others, on having all this this weird, ancient, semi-dead heresies actually mean something in your day-to-day -day life, in your relations to others, in your relations to the world, in your relationship to yourself. So that that's definitely what keeps me coming back. And we're not just saying, you know, the, obviously there's lots of great other Gnostic churches out there, other great movements. It's not just a, a Gnostic thing I, i've noticed some of the the things that jason was talking about uh and his eminence were talking about that we want to avoid in all sorts of groups um all sorts of different religious groups all sorts of different meditation groups so it's definitely not just our our corner of the uh of the religious world so so that said should we dive into uh fabri palaprat with his amazing sideburns and, and awesome pants? let's do it okay uh eminence <laughs> and uh, uh uh can you give us a brief elevator speech of who <laughs> <Bob Ray? laughs> <laughs> of who Bob Ray well, that was. And 90 I seconds. think at the I think at the end of this, however many parts it turns out to be, you know, we're probably gonna we're probably gonna rewind to to Jason's questions because you know, for some of the stuff that I put out there about why this stuff matters. Uh, you know, but let's talk about the the you know the the I guess the the mundane uh you know details. I mean Bernard Raymond Faber Palaprat um you know, was a guy, uh, you know, born in, in, in chords, however you pronounce it. My, my French is, is terrible. I mean, when I was growing up, I, I, I went to, uh, French, uh, immersion. So, you know, for that particular time in school, um, you know, we spoke exclusively French. Um, and then, you know, once I got to, once I got later on to out of elementary into junior high, um, you know, I, I dropped doing French entirely thinking I'm never going to need this stuff. Um, but of course it turns out now, you know, but there you go. So, I mean, my foresight was not fantastic, but, uh, you know, I also, I also played in, in crappy puck pants. So what are you, what are you going to do? Um, so Bernard Rabin Faber Palaprat was, Faber Palaprat was born in, in Cords in France. Um, 
uh, in the in the district known as Albi of all things, of course. And from Albi, we get Albigensian, um, which you know is the soil in which the Cathars uh, uh, grew. Um, you know, he came from uh, you know a family of lawyers and poets and and uh, interesting people. And of course, he turned out to be uh, pretty interesting. Um, you know himself. He did. He studied. Uh, you know, he studied to be a priest, and in fact, he was uh, he was a priest at one point in time. And I should mention, you know, when we talk about way back when, you know, he was born in 1773, roughly off the top of my head. I used to think it was 1777 for some reason, but that's not correct. He was born in, in uh, you know, 1773. And, uh, you know, and as, you know, this is happening, you know, less and less these days, but back back then you have at least when you're dealing with things roman catholic you have what's called minor seminary and you have major seminary and, and and minor seminary turns out to be more like you know junior high high school with religion shoved into it right and major seminaries where you actually you know embark on uh you know formal training or formation so this is a guy who was uh you know eventually ordained a priest while he's pretty young early 20s um if i remember right and uh, but it doesn't seem to you know it doesn't seem to have um you know stuck with them in that sense now of course you know he's he's spiritual he's obviously uh religious and that's not just because it's the backdrop of the time i mean you you don't go through that without you don't go through ordination without having some kind of spiritual in, impulse but i'm also not sure and you know uh, this could be dependent on historical context you know i'm not I'm not so sure, you know, how well he was cared for by the institution or not, or whether he just had a side, whether he needed it as a job or he had a side interest um, in medicine, both could be true. Um, a year after his ordination, he decides to pursue medicine and he studies to become a doctor and he does. And at that point in time, uh, he ends up becoming a, uh, he ends up becoming a, a surgeon. He moves to Paris and he becomes a, a surgeon. Uh, that's off the top of my head. You know, I, I've done six or seven, eight hours worth of presentations, all connecting in some way or another um, to uh, Palaprat's Joanite Church. So if I'm forgetting details here, I'm pretty sure I've included them there. So, uh, you know, if this stuff interests you in any way, uh, please go go look up the presentations in which I will correct everything, in which is corrected everything that I get wrong today. But yeah. basically, yeah, he becomes a priest and he becomes a, a, a surgeon and he ends up living in Paris. Yeah, yeah, very cool. So it's, um, oh yeah, so I'm looking through my, my questions here, but I'm still trying to get a, you know, give people a sense of him outside of the religion stuff. So so I understand that he was sort of renowned outside of religion. Like he, he did important medical experiments with electricity and he was awarded some of France's highest military honors. Is that right? Well, you get some of this stuff. I mean, you know, it's it, it's important to kind of not lump these together as one chunk because this is stuff that happens over the course of his life. I mean, you have you know you have some stuff that you know refers to him, of course, as a surgeon, as a podiatrist. Um, you know, he also works with what was called then you know galvanism, which was essentially uh, medicine that that works with uh, uh, electricity. And, you know, which is pretty groundbreaking stuff in its day. Now, then again, you know, you look, you, you look back, you know, if we look today at, at, you know, the groundbreaking medicine of, you know, yesteryear, yester century, I don't think I'd want to be one of the, you know, first patients on the table or in the doctor's office for some of this stuff. But unfortunately, some doctor needed to do it and some patient needed to undergo it to, in order, in order to arrive where we're at today. But yes, I mean, there were, to a certain degree, he was kind of at the, on the cutting edge, uh, you know, for his time, as far as as far as I understand it, because I mean, you know, you're, you know, elect, electricity, of course, you know, in the history of the world and the universe, um, um, you know, is not a new thing. However, relatively to the entire length of human history, um, playing with it certainly is to us, it is it is a new thing. And so Palaprat, as best I as best I can tell, at least for his place and time, um, was on the forefront of of using those things to uh, treat patients. He also, um, you know, he also at one point essentially became, um, if I remember right, uh, you know, he had a, a court physician or you know court prominence type role within the court of uh, Emperor Napoleon, uh, the General Napoleon Bonaparte, who eventually 
of course, would become uh, emperor of, of all France. Yeah. Um, so so he, he, he studied to become a priest, then he became a doctor, uh, then he moved to Paris. And, and this is, is Paris where, where oh. his... Oh, sorry. Go you, ahead. You, sorry, I was going to mention you mentioned you mentioned the military thing. Oh, that right, thing, the military honors. Yeah, that thing. Uh, you know, uh, and I really should have. You know, my focus has been on Palaprat and less on Napoleon. So I really should have brushed up on my Napoleon before I came in here. Not that my stuff on Napoleon uh, was particularly good, but it, you know, at one point when folks were trying to, uh, if I remember right, if they were trying to stick it to Napoleon, I can't remember if it was like 18, 14, 18, whatever. But, you know, at one point, uh, Palaprat was involved um, in the defense of Paris, of course. And, you know, uh, and he was, uh, you know, he was fighting on the side. And I use fighting in quotations because he's a doctor and a priest, so he's not necessarily out there fighting, but he's working with and helping people. And so, you know, he's, you know, he's involved on, you know, the side of Napoleon. Uh, during the defense of, during the de defense of uh, Paris, and uh, you know, treating patients and you know, assist assisting people in a time of battle, and for that, you know, he was awarded the relatively newly created Legion of Honor, mm -hmm. uh, which continues to this, you know, to the present day. Um, I believe even in uh, you know secular France as uh, one of the higher orders of of merit. Because Legion of Honor, if I remember right, was created by Napoleon, and continues to exist to the present day. So yeah, so he was he was made a knight in in the in the Legion of Honor for for his efforts during the defense of Paris. Very cool. Okay, so Paris. So he uh, so he moves to Paris, and this is where sort of his his Joannite, uh uh, journey begins, or I should say, his his Templar uh, uh, journey. Both, both. So he he joins the Masons in Paris. Is that it? And then he 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 discovers documents that started his Templar journey. So so can you tell us about if you know anything about his Masonic career, but also if you can tell us about these these mysterious documents and uh, how how they led to the the formation or maybe the restarting of uh, of a uh, of a Templar order. Well, you know, the, the, the funny thing about this period or this point in Palaprat's history and kind of, you know, we know where he began, we know where he arrived, but there's a bit of a, there's a, bit of a jumble in the middle, you know, it's like when you read the, the gospel of uh, Philip, I think it is, where, you know, there's the, you know, the kind of implied reference to, you know, Jesus kissing Mary Magdalene, but it doesn't actually say that, we just kind of put it in there because it seems to, you know, it seems to to make sense. Like, you know, somebody managed to just cut out or lose the most important part or, or detail. So there's a certain element uh, to that, you know, where Palaprat's life is is concerned um, as to which came first, chicken, eggs, those those kind of things. He does become a Mason. He becomes a high grade uh, Mason. He becomes, uh, you know, involved with uh, Chevalier de la Croix. Uh, you know the lodge of the knights of the knights of the cross, and a lot of the people who will end up becoming the officers and the prime movers and shakers in the uh, reconstituted order of the temple come out of the, this lodge of masons. Now, um, uh, so there's there's a heavy masonic overlap, and there's also heavy masonic content within his order, and the, and then later his, his his church. Now, where this Templar stuff comes from. That's a little bit more of a mystery because there's been competing stories and competing histories, you know, on the internet and in print, um, you know, for the better part of 200 years, right? Uh, now, of course, the internet's a, a recent thing, but, you know, a lot of this stuff is getting pulled from books and getting repeated on the internet. And so that now you've got, you, you have a whole bunch of different uh, narratives. You know, one says that documents were discovered in a Paris bookstall, you know, which is a, a common kind of esoteric or occult uh, cliche where, you know, somebody discovers a, a cache of secret documents or just happens to buy or get given or stumbled over or beaten over the head with, you know, some document of, of secret or historical or mystical import. There's another, you know, there's another accounting that essentially, you know, this stuff is found, you know, rolled up in the furniture or a table leg um, you know, or some guy's couch, you know, the, of the Duke de Orleans, right? Um, there, there are definitely some takes that kind of roll those two into one because one, you're dealing with, 
you know, the book stall idea um, is that of the Leviticon and the so-called primitive gospel of John. And the Templar documents seem to come from the direction of the stories of finding random stuff in people's, uh, in, in nobility, in French nobility's, uh, you know, furniture uh, stash there in order to protect it, you know, uh, from the ravages of the French Revolution type of thing. So at some point there, you know, there is a, there is a discovery of documents that are made, but there's also, um, you know, there's also a transmission or continuity of uh, authority of, of a supposed earlier uh, Templar group that basically lands in the lap of these officers, um, you know, all of whom come out of this Masonic circle. And uh, the last uh, in their accounting for this Templar order, um, the last of their grand masters uh, got the, basically got the guillotine, as I, as I recall, during the the French Revolution, um, and I, I could, I could be muddy, muddy on who side, who was on whose side, but basically, um, you know, around uh, 1790, 1791, the last, you know, Grand Master of a Templar continuation goes under, and the office of Grand Master basically, uh, you know, sits in limbo until the circle of officers for this Templar order to be. Um, basically transmitted to Palaprat in the form of uh, an election that they had the right to continue this on. And after a gap that's brought, after a gap in activity that's brought on by the revolution, they essentially uh, elect him Grand Master and they substantiate this, um, you know, with documents that were essentially entrusted and hidden uh, in the care of the last Grand Master. So, um, sorry, that was a little bit, a little bit of a, a, a maze because it's hard to it's hard to tell you know exactly which points and all that come first but basically um you know there are parallel there are parallel streams there you know there's an office that basically gets cut short that is basically you know held in trust to be passed on to somebody else at a time when it's safe and then there's the documents that substantiate that order and those claim claims that tend to come with it it's important to note that the the Leviticon, the pr primitive gospels on which, uh, you know, Palaprat based some of his spirituality um, would come uh, about a decade later and to be discovered in, in a book stall. So you know, the problem with Palaprat is, is that people talk about, you know, uh, discovering secret documents or caches of documents, but there's where this is concerned, there's actually several and they come kind of, uh, uh you know at at different points and there's some that get retroactively applied but we can get into that later yeah and uh i'd just like to clarify as well you know we'll link to our past shows on the templars but but of course you know the templars are are destroyed it's according to history and mm -hmm. then the the group that that paulo Prash is uh becoming the head of the documents that he found is is Sometimes you will read that you know Paolo Pratt uh, faked the group that he made it all up, but but it does seem to be a French revival among uh, French noble people, noble men going back to the 1700s. So early 1700s of some sort of Templar revival. Now they might have made everything up, but we know that it's at least almost 100 years older than than Paolo Pratt. But can, yeah. can you tell us uh, about? the um the larmenius charter and about the legends that that is in well, the, some of these documents that he that he that he discovers that he finds so these these documents that you know get recovered and like i said you know accounts differ but the most common account is that these documents are are kind of recovered from the last grand master of roughly palaprat's era being the i think philippe duke d'orleans you know, they get discovered, you know, uh, uh, in the reservoir of his toilet or the furniture or the drawer of his desk or, you know, under his trash can. They yeah. basically ba basically say that these documents were recovered from his furniture um, by one of Palaprat's uh, brothers, Jacques-Philippe Ledru. And some of these documents basically point to a uh, earlier form of Templar revival, the one that you're referring to in the early 1700s. Um, uh, you know, and also have kind of regulations and statutes and, and uh, whatnot for, for, for governance. So they refer to an organization that was active um, in, in 1705. And so some of this, you know, one of the things that often, yeah, as you mentioned, gets pegged onto Palaprat or gets pinned to him is the idea that he, he made it up. They forged some, some documents, they discovered some documents 
And, you know, he basically said, you know, I'm, I'm the, I'm the Templar Grandmaster and 10 years later, you know, I'm the John and Pope, um, you know, and we have all the documents, you know, with our own signatures on it um, to prove it. But I believe that the, you know, I, I think, you know, well, obviously some of this stuff is lost to history and we're not going to substantiate it. Looking at the accounts that kind of surround Palaprat's activity, looking at the detractions and accusations or not that are that are made by his adversaries or enemies um no one here is suggesting he he made it up there's lots of things i mean his order eventually goes into a pretty significant uh, uh schism he does have some uh, detractors but you know uh scholars at the time contemporary contemporary enemies or adversaries um other people involved in uh, you know on the other side of the schism so called that would happen later on no one accuses him of being being a fake and so the my interpretation of these things as i understand it is i think palaprat received and enacted these things um you know in good faith if somebody made the, this stuff up it wasn't him so one of the things that came to him and it's important to remember that the order came before the church um one of the one of the one of the things that came to him of course uh, was the office of grandmaster and this this survival of you know uh grandmaster of the order of the temple of the knights uh, templar um you know is based on a document called the larminius charter or the carta transmissionis um charter of transmission basically um and the larminius charter of course is the telling of a story of a legend essentially where you know uh jacques de molay gets gets uh uh, essentially uh, transfers his office um, to a, uh, a Palestinian uh, Palestinian Templar Grand Prior by the name of Jean-Marc Larminius. Um, and uh, that Larminius in turn um, transmits it to somebody else because he's he's older, you know, 60s, 70s at the time, at least if you if you believe the accounting of the, the legends. I remember Larminius was an older man. Perhaps I'm thinking of of Mole, but uh, Larminius himself isn't young. But basically, so this office is secretly, you know, in order to preserve the Templars, is secretly transmitted to Jean-Marc Larminius, and Larminius in turn, um, you know, transmits it down the line until eventually this secret line of Grand Masters, um, you know, pops up um, either in 1804 or in 1705 right the whether or not the 1705, 1705 folks and there's every evidence to to suggest that there is a revival of the templars in 1705 and that is it is this same revival which connects to or gives birth to the 1804 group of, of palaprat but whether or not the 1705 group actually used the larminius charter i don't know but at, at any rate the 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 1805 or 1804 uh, uh, counting of the Larminius Charter and the and the usage of the legend incorporates the 1705 folks as a part of its lineage and a part of its legend. And I do believe the 1705 thing was real. Now, whether or not they incorporated Larminius is an entirely um, different story. But basically, there is a yeah, there is a secret line of Templar Grandmasters um, which continues up into the present day, and it's brought back into the public by you know. Um, by its new grandmaster bernard raymond faber palaprat yeah um what was i going to say oh yeah so some of this may sound like a, a weird thing to build a church on but i would just like to point out that the anglicans are built on a horny king so folks have have an open mind uh <laughs> jason before well, and if, the larminius legend you know you remind me of the the church thing you know it's the church thing that's important they're not the horny, yeah. horny king but the the um you know the other thing is that this this larminius legend this line of grandmasters doesn't simply you know uh you know begin with jacques de molay and jean-marc larminius and end with paber palaprat the totality of the legend goes further back to uh the founder of the templars hugh de payen and with the idea that essentially that um, Hugh de Payen, um, you know, as the inaugurator of, of the Templars, uh, himself inherited a, a lineage of a Church of John, 
right? Which goes back to the, you know, the time of the apostles being a time of Christ. So you're not just getting a survival of, um, you know, the Templar order, you're getting a, you know, both a revelation and a survival of a church of John, of a hidden church of John. Yeah. And uh, I'm really glad you brought that up because, you know, that that's a really important part of the, the legend for me. It, even though I was making that that horny that horny king joke, you know, we keep saying legend. I, I'm sure we'll we'll have a discussion uh, at the end uh, about about that term and about lineage and about why these stories are are important. Uh, but for me, having some sort of heritage, some sort of story, some sort of legend that brings us all together, you know, that does talk about this this alternative form of Christianity, this Joanite form of Christianity that goes all the way back 2,000 years. But but to clarify, Your Eminence, if, if I want to join the AJC or if I want to become clergy in the AJC, I, I don't have to literally believe this, right? I don't have to sign no. up and you give no. me a document and I say, this this no. definitely happened, this is history. Uh, it, it's not a requirement to literally believe that, no. that, that this, this is secret lineage. You know, and I, I think this is something I was going to connect, you know, eventually to the thing I mentioned about relationality, right? I mean, the idea, you know, lot, Freemasonry has what they call a traditional history, where they talk about, you know, the dawn of time, the Temple of Solomon, all those other kind of things. Um, you know, is that fact? Probably not. Is there a measure of truth to it? Yes, it is. And yes, there is. Because, you know, myth, myths will tell you about things that are true. They won't necessarily tell you about things that are facts, right? And once you understand that, once you, once you separate it out and know it for what it is, then you can, then you can get the spiritual nutrients from it, you know, um, without abusing it or without trying to create a, a literalism or a literal history or a little, literal fact that it's not. Um, you know, there, I, was, I was born in Ontario. Um, I was born in Hamilton, uh, Ontario. But I spent my childhood in Winnipeg, Manitoba, um, you know, home of Portage of Maine, 50 Below, you know, Randy Bachman, Neil Young, that type of thing. And uh, uh, Manitoba, of course, you know, part of the reason why Manitoba became a province, why it joined Confederation was, was uh, uh, because of an interesting guy by the name of Louis Riel. You know, Louis Riel was, you know, part-time religious prophet um, I mean, a lot of people don't know that, you know, he essentially had a little bit of, you know, culty stuff going on. And, you know, he was a prophet of his kind of own stream of Christianity. And being Métis, for those who don't know, being Métis, of course, you know, is the heritage of uh, uh, mixed ancestry between being uh, First Nation and being uh, Quebec French, for example. Um, or, you know, back then at that point, they were, you know, simply French. And uh, and so uh, Louis Riel was a, a Métis uh, leader who who essentially um, fought against the government. He actually fought in a series of of you know rebellions to to basically to stand up for his community, to stand up for you know what was then Manitoba, um, and of course now it had religious and apocalyptic and prophetic overtones. And I don't want to sidetrack into that, but basically he was a guy who who fought for his people and, and fought for what he believed in. Um, opinions on him to this day are divided at, you know, at one point in time, um, you know, he was branded a traitor. In fact, he was hung for it, if I recall correctly. He was hung for being a, a traitor, but at the same time, it was his efforts that meant uh, Manitoba became, a, the province of Manitoba became a part of Canada. Don't worry, I'm going somewhere with this. <laughs> the, and so Manitoba has a, has a rich heritage of, of, uh, Métis culture, First Nations culture, and French culture. And, and, you know, and one of the driving forces behind this, of course, is the controversial figure of Louis Riel. Now, there is a French quarter in Winnipeg uh, called St. Boniface. Every year they have their, you know, they have their winter festival, much in the same way that Quebec has a winter festival, where, you know, the funny looking, you know, plushy Michelin man kind of Stay Puft Marshmallow Man looking guy, the Bon Homme, Bon comes out, you know, and so, you know, they have the, in Winnipeg, they have the Festival de Voyageur, and the Bonhomme comes out and does those things. So, you know, I've spent plenty of time in St. Boniface, and I think we even lived there briefly for a time as, when I was a kid. But one of the things, if you go to St. Boniface in Winnipeg, one of the things you absolutely have to see is the St. Boniface Cathedral. And, I mean, it's huge. It's, it's a it's Roman Catholic cathedral. And the interesting thing is that it burned down like six times. I mean, these guys, you know, after six times, they just couldn't get fire safety right. 
And on um, the sixth time when it burned, they left it. And the, the significant thing about the sixth time, um, of course, is that the fire was so bad. And you can see pictures from the 50s or 60s. For, fire was so bad that basically it burnt through the, the roof because the, the structure, the bones of the cathedral is stone, but the, the, the roof was wood. And they also had this, you know, this massive um, circular stained glass window. And the heat was so intense that basically it, it melted the seal um you know which supported and connected the stained glass window and basically the thing fell out and smashed so now saint boniface cathedral is a ruin that con continues to exist within the middle just over the river from downtown winnipeg right and in the in the heart of saint boniface you have essentially ruins right in the middle of a modern city and uh, and built on the back end of it rather than tear down the ruins they built the new cathedral on the back end of it now, anybody who's ever seen a cathedral or spent some time with churches or architecture, you know, cathedrals are designed to do one thing. When you walk inside them, you look up, right? They're designed to not just elevate your eye, but elevate your, elevate your spirit. And so you have this open air, you know, where now instead of looking up to the cross, it looks up to the sky. And it's just a gorgeous thing. But if you turn around from those ruins, Right. If you if you go, you know, if you if you don't go into the ruins of the cathedral, right outside the ruins of the cathedral, there's a cemetery. And um, in one of the one of the graves closest to the ruins of the cathedral, you know, is essentially almost like a monolith or standing stone, which is dedicated to Louis Riel. And, you know, I've been to that cathedral more more times than I can count. And I've been there. I mentioned my grandpa at the start of it, you know, and I've been there with, uh, uh, you know, uh, with my family and I believe even with my grandpa. And one of the interesting things, you know, all this, you know, to to connect is ruined cathedral and, you know, French and Métis and Louis Riel and the Red River Rebellion and, and, and all this other kind of stuff is there was a story my grandpa used to tell me when I was a kid that were related to Louis Riel. Now, he said, we're obviously not related to Louis Riel by blood. That's obvious, right? Because, you know, our family is Dutch and, and Irish and Louis Riel was very much neither. It's, you know, we, you know, we are not, we're not Métis or French, but we were related to Louis Riel by, by marriage that essentially our family married into his or the other way around, somewhere to the degree of a, you know, great, great, great aunt or, or uncle or something along those lines. But basically there's a connection between our family and Louis Riel's family. Why does that matter, right? Why, why, you know, my, you know, you know, my grandpa grew up, uh, you know, uh, in a, you know, in a farming family that was, you know, pretty poor and pretty uneducated and, you know, Dutch, Dutch Canadian and, uh, you know, Calvinist and, and all this other kind of stuff. Why tell that story? Does it, does it measurably improve the standing of our family whatsoever does it make us better people or more interesting people there isn't even a blood connection there's just something that you would call that you'd say that there was you know in the air my grandpa was somebody of principle and my grandpa admired people of principle and so for him this kind of connection where he tells the story of how we're connected to this wider historical context that doesn't mean that we're them right you know in the same way that i'm not my dad but my dad influences and contributes and creates the conditions and the context of, of all those things that, that lead or influence or nudge me to be the person that I am, right? And so much in the same way, right? This is why this stuff matters, you know, that Palaprat, I mean, and we are linearly connected to Palaprat, you know, through ordination, lineage and all this other kind of stuff, but we're not the same church we're influenced by, we're a descendant of that church, but that church created the conditions, the principles, the environment, the, all those things in the air that would germinate into the kind of ideas and, and practices that you see see today. And much in the same way that they were germinated and in, influenced by their thing of their day. You know, there was a storyteller um, that I was, I was both listening to and, and reading to the other day in the context of some other research, and he was talking about the concept of Irish Christianity, Celtic Christianity, and, and you know, and he made reference to say that the Old Testament for Irish Christians wasn't the Hebrew Bible; it was nature, mm -hmm. right? For them, 
the foundation on which they built their New Testament practice in their church and all that stuff wasn't the Old Testament. It was their relationship with the land. So the Old Testament for Palaprat was the idea of spiritual chivalry, the idea of standing up for and assisting your 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 neighbor, the idea of you know of 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 rationality with you know of discarding superstition, you know of of all these kind of things. So that essentially there's a kind of backdrop or a thing in the air for for Palaprat that he translates into his own version and he focuses through his prism to inform his own practice. And in turn, he becomes the backdrop or the Old Testament, so to speak, for us, if that makes sense. It does. It does. And you know what? That's actually a pretty good place to to wind up for, for part one. Uh, but we're going to do we're going to do <laughs> oh, part God, two. I don't even think we scratched the surface. I'm I know. Sure half, half that's <laughs> intelligible. No, I mean, that's pretty good. We oh. got like three free questions. That's so pretty good. And there's uh, some there was some real good, uh, uh, real good answers in there. So, yeah. Thank you, Sean. This has been this has been great so far. Um, yeah. We'll take a quick break, maybe, and uh, get ready yeah, for part two. Sure. Yep. And uh, before we go, because this will be separate uh, uh, plugs, which is mylandmeditation.substack.com. That's free meditation I do every Sunday morning. It's going to be a hybrid mix online and in person. We're going to broadcast the in-person sessions once I come back to Montreal. Uh, and you can also check out, I'm doing Jason's plug, which is jasonmebel.com. Oh, wait, I lost my banner thing. Okay, here we go. For the people at home, they can see it on the screen. That's very important. Sagetheater.com. And your eminence, I already have two plugs lined up for you. Um, oh, I understand people can know more about the church at... Joanite.org. Yeah. And uh, and also, you know, if you're if you're visiting, uh, well, if you're visiting any city with, uh, with a Joe and I parish, uh, stick your head in. But uh, also the information for His Eminence's parish in Calgary is there. So if you're in Calgary for some reason, you know, I'm sure check it out. Hey, the Montreal info is there, you know, come visit Montreal, whatever, wherever you are, you know, stick your head into a service. Montreal sometime. has better food. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and, and also, Your Eminence, we, uh, I, I've been, uh, a plug that I've been forgetting to do lately is uh, the upcoming con Conclave. Can you just very, very quickly tell us about, about Conclave, what it is, and uh, how, how this is a year where everybody can go? Well, you know, Conclave is, is one of those things that we've been doing annually. and We've been doing it for a couple decades now. Um, it's basically where we get together, you know, folks who are interested in Gnosticism, who are interested in esotericism. Uh, some of those are members and clergy of the AJC, um, but not all of them. You know, we get folks from other organizations and other uh, communities. It, you know, it is an ecumenical and in interfaith space, but it's also, it started as a way to bring together Joanite laity and clergy um, you know, essentially as a, you know, as a, as a week long, uh, you know, retreat to, to gather in meditation and prayer and ritual to, you know, discuss, um, you know, big ideas to, to, to commune, to break bread together. Uh, basically like a retreat and a conference rolled into one. And we've been doing it for a couple uh, decades and, and no pandemic is going to stop us and hasn't stopped us yet we've just simply moved it for the time being online. So in its current iteration, because of the present situation of the world, Conclave is three days long. Um, they're relatively all day affairs. They start in the early afternoon and go well into the evening. And it's three days of uh, lectures and workshops on, uh, on Gnosticism, on religion, on spirituality, variety of topics. Um, you know, uh, we've got some great, uh, Great, fantastic scholars. We have uh, James McGrath, Dr. James McGrath, who, of course, is, you know, uh, a champion returning guest for Talk Gnosis. I know because I'm also a fan of the show. Um, so James McGrath will be there. He's going to be talking about uh, John the Baptist and Mandeans. We also have a well-known and well-loved uh, Zen master, James Ishmael Ford, who's also a Unitarian minister. Um, and also spent some time uh, in the independent sacramental movement. So he has an interest in all things Gnostic and esoteric. He's going to be there and talking about the knowing of Zen Buddhism. Uh, yeah, we, you know, we've, we've got lots of, we've got uh, uh, talk gnosis guest and longtime friend of the church, Dr. Jeffrey Kupperman, um, coming out to talk about uh, the body of light, I think it was, Hermeticism and the Body of Light, uh, off the top of my head. I mean, the title's much longer. When you're dealing with Dr. Kupperman, the, the title is as long as the presentation, but we love them for it. 
Um, so we've got a, you know, and and uh, my two IC, uh, Mark Thomas, Dr. William Bean is going to be talking about uh, Zoroastrianism. We have a whole host of interesting lectures. It's all online. It's three days. You know, it's a marathon. We'll leave you some bathroom breaks and some coffee breaks, but it's a marathon of education, uh, you know, bad jokes, human connection, and a way to kind of learn and explore, uh, you know, about Gnosticism, about the world, and of course, uh, about yourself. And the best part is, is it's dirt friggin' cheap. Um, you know, you're, you're getting 14, 15, 16 hours of education, interactive education that you can participate in, um, or not, you can hide in the corner if you want. Um, but you're, you're getting hours and hours of stuff. And it's like a 100 bucks for the entire weekend, 50 bucks, if you're a student, go, go sign up for a yoga class, and then slip me slip me your student card and say you're a student, and it's yours for 50 bucks. I kid you not, right? Like we're, you know, our idea is not to make money. Our idea is to bring people together to help people to, to learn and to understand and connect. This is why we, this is why we do this, you know, having a, having a price attached is simply to cover our costs, right? So, you know, like if, if you're, you know, if you're a, you know, if you're a student of any stripe, you know, show us your card and bam, you got half off. If you find you're, you know, you're, you're uh, in difficulty, um, you know, because, you know, uh, wages are low and prices are out of control and, and whatnot, or, you know, you've just been on an insane better, bender and frankly spent all your cash. If you're in difficulty, <laughs> just let us know. We will give you a heavy, heavy discount. We are not here to make money. It is three days of connection, of education, of spirituality with quality people, just like the two guys I'm talking to. Come and do it. It's cheap. Trust me, you won't regret it. Very awesome. Okay, everybody. Well, we'll see you all at Conclave. And this is Deacon John signing off for now. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody.